Tanri Beng, you are the, the former minister in Indonesia for state enterprises. You were minister in the late 90s, um, first yeah. under President Suharto. Um, you are now chairman of the uh, of PT Telecom, yeah, so um, of, the, latest, yeah, of the commissioner of uh, the board. Mm. Indonesia is doing pretty well these days in terms of its economy. How, how would you assess the, uh, the economic situation at the moment? I think we are doing, I would call we're doing enough, but not enough, uh, in a sense that we've been, uh, you know, sort of growing economically uh, at the level of 4 to 5 percent, which uh, is okay, but uh, it's not enough really to provide uh, more uh, job for uh, the uh, you know unemployed and the new uh, labor force uh, coming into the market so we need uh, to grow at about six to seven percent at least uh, to be able to you know improve the uh, employment condition in Indonesia and we do have the potential to achieve that kind of growth. Well, that's the sort of uh, target that President Yudhoyono is aiming for. He's, yeah, I he's think just starting now a aiming, second term. Now, uh, uh, I think aiming for 7%. And I think they could do that if they just uh, sort of uh, uh, prioritize uh, the uh, infrastructure development. I think this is uh, the, the, the most lacking uh, development in Indonesia since uh, President Suharto, there was hardly any development in infrastructure. Uh, so we are talking about almost 10 years. So if the government is pushing and prioritizing the development of infrastructure from electricity to harbor to ports, uh, roads, I think it will not only create new jobs, but it will facilitate for the industry to grow. Where would that money come from? From the government, or would you say the uh, I think private they should sector? come from both uh, government and the private sector. There is not much actually from the government. Even the electricity, we can actually attract, say, uh, private money, whether it's uh, domestic private money or foreign private money, because the economic, uh, I think, model uh, can work uh, in this infrastructure. Speaking here about infrastructure, but right. the, the government's plan at the moment seems to be to pump a lot of money into uh, small businesses. It's talking about something like $2 billion. Yeah, I think for Indonesia, small business is important because uh, the small, medium to even uh, the informal sector contributes uh, significantly to the uh, national uh, productivity. Now. Uh, and then, you know, it touches on the people's uh, uh, life or uh, And it accounts economy. for something like a third of the economy. Uh, even more than that, uh, the, the uh, both if you combine the informal sector and small medium enterprises. So I think it is correct the government do that because the, the private sector, the uh, foreign investors, and also the state-owned enterprises can actually generate capital by themselves. They just needed to be given the opportunities uh, and given the, uh, let's say, the transparency and equal treatment for everybody. Uh, and I think this is what the uh, Yurayono government is trying to do, a level playing ground. And I think uh, that would help the incentive for foreign companies, national companies, and state-owned enterprise to together work together cooperatively and or compete among each other. So this is a, this is a, a healthy uh, direction uh, of the government policy. You were overseeing privatization in the late 90s yeah, at the right. time of the uh, Asian financial crisis yeah. and then saw many companies failing as you've just <laughs> said at the, the leadership summit here in Asia. Uh, but the state-owned enterprises, somewhat surprisingly, still account for a huge chunk of the economy yeah. in, in Indonesia. You see, what happened was that uh, during the crisis in 1997-98, the government needed uh, funding, you know, from for for the fiscal, from the uh, privatization of state-owned enterprises. However, there were issues in trying to push through privatizations. Number one, there was political resistance. Number two, internally, when you 
go into the inside of the state-owned enterprises. None of the management was interested to, to privatize. So uh, because of that, uh, you know, sort of resistance, uh, until today, we have not really been able to do privatizations. So I changed my strategy instead of privatization was uh, consolidations and making it more profitable. So over time, then you can privatize uh, through the IPO. So this is the, the, the course that has been, uh, you know, followed. However, with this course, you know, you will find that you're going to be inherited with the state on enterprises. Uh, but this is what the public uh, wants, and then you cannot really, you know, bulldoze of that. So, uh, at the end of the day, until today, we still maintain the uh, 140 odd state owned enterprises. Uh, very little has been privatized. And it's something like 60% of the corporate, corporate sector uh, yeah, is yeah, still, still state owned. Still state owned enterprises. So, is there an issue in terms of the, the government um, owning? Uh, the companies. So you, t you spoke at the, the summit yeah. here about um, uh, political connections yeah, that's having right. such a major influence. I think uh, on the on the one hand, there is a need to let's say professionalize yeah, the state-owned enterprises so that we can create more value. But unfortunately, the political environment has not allowed that to happen. Uh, even after the restructuring of those state-owned enterprises, the, the, the political intervention to the management of the state-owned enterprises is still very, very uh, high. Uh, for example, appointing members of the board of directors. Uh, they will come from different political parties or political uh, powers. And this makes it very, very difficult for, let's say, a CEO or a chairman of the company because it's very difficult to pull together the team when you have different uh, sort of conflicting uh, sources of power in the company itself. So this is what I think uh, needs to be addressed. You know, the issue in this area must be addressed. And you, you're also saying that uh, companies need to um, move from, say, being um, entrepreneur-led yeah. to being more scientifically managed. They need the entrepreneurial approach uh, because state-owned enterprises have been too much uh, bureaucratically driven. They could, uh, you know, deploy more entrepreneurial sort of uh, uh, perspective to grow the company. That is something that is needed. However, however, in the process of doing so, there must be a professional management system in place so that the entrepreneurial drive in replacement of the bureaucratic uh, dominance can be balanced by the professional management discipline. This is what Indonesia needs, uh, actually. Does that necessarily mean a Western management techniques? I mean, you spoke, you spoke about Huawei, the Chinese company. Well, I think when you talk about management, management is management. When you talk in terms of the science of management, uh, it applies everywhere. So there is only, there is only one you know, way in, in, managing, in managing scientifically. Uh, it's American, European, and now these are all applied uh, in, in, in the emerging markets, uh, China, India, uh, uh, well, Singapore, Malaysia, and I think Indonesia needs to get into the bandwagon as well. One of the issues for the president is mm -hmm. that he wants to cut down on the amount of red tape, but it, it's been an issue for a, a long time in Indonesia. I think this is an area where Indonesia is still in the learning process. So we are in the transitions, you know, transition from, let's say, centralized government to uh, democracy to uh, decentralization. And the problem is that during the last 10 years, we have had four changes in the leadership of uh, the country. So consistency and continuity of the policy have been uh, disrupted. Now, I must say that that during the last five years of Yudhoyono's uh, uh, sort of leadership, certain consistency had been maintained and stability had been maintained. 
However, we need to do more specifically in the area of how can you facilitate for, let's say, corporate to function uh, in, in, in line with the international standards, you know, the, the governance. Now, I think when you talk about governance, the sto state on enterprise, I think, is, is, is ahead. That is why I, I have been promoting for foreign companies to, to partner with the state-owned enterprises in the new investment in Indonesia. Because the state-owned enterprise governance, I think, is a lot more solid than, let's say, the private sector. Yeah. Just finally, can corruption's been endemic yeah. in Indonesia, still is, and e even your company from time to time has uh, mm -hmm. um, had investigations, graft investigations. Yeah. Will Indonesia ever be able to become a cleanly run country? You know, when you want to clean up, the, the law enforcement first must be clean. And this is an area that we have uh, been, uh, you know, really facing tough uh, uh, process to, to go through. Yeah? Uh, just now we are facing the police and the, uh, and the prosecution officers are you know being questions so i think that's number one yeah uh in terms of the government let's say the president i think he has shown the real intention and the example of trying to portray clean government but there again uh, the system must be in place to you know to ensure that the due processes of doing business, uh, government, uh, government administrations are done correctly. Uh, so before, I think, you know, this is why it will take some time, because before you do that, you have to actually uh, reform the institution itself, institution within the government. You know the the law enforcement institutions, the uh, let's say the finance ministry because there's a lot of resource going through that and other ministries. So the government institutions must be reformed first because they are the one who's got to ensure that the 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 practices uh, are in line with the prescribed uh, procedures and that the corruption can be controlled from that process. If you rely on outsider, it will be difficult. You must have internally uh, sort of uh, managed process to reduce and eventually eliminate the, the corrupt practices. That is why I said it will take some time because you have to go through institutional uh, development. But do you think that deters foreign investment and the red tape? and then I'm putting off in potential investors from mm. uh, from abroad. Yeah, because effectively they know they may be having to pay an additional tax. I don't think that is the case anymore. Uh, it's things are reasonably transparent. In other words, if you have issues, you can openly, you know, take it up. And uh, uh, I, I guess you know, ten years ago, you have to rely on a uh, political connection. Today, you're basically, uh, you know, uh, independently can actually uh, go to the government and, and, and take up your cases. So I think uh, uh, the, the red tapes, yeah, probably the, the issue here is that there is a lot of decentralization is taking place and some of the issues of permits well, we, we, uh, are given in the s in the regions, and they are not yet ready uh, to 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 sort of uh, handle, uh, you know, investment uh, investor, you know, huge investment flow, for example. So that it it's to me is a, is a management issues rather than the much of a corruption in this area in the in in the foreign investment area. Tanuri Bang, former uh, Minister for State Enterprises in Indonesia. Thanks for joining us at the Leadership Summit in Asia Thank and you. on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you, sir. Great.